Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our presentation this evening entitled At Home Together, a webinar hosted by Banner Alzheimer's Institute Tucson. My name is Heather Mulder, and I am pleased to serve as your moderator for today's discussion. Thank you attendees for being an important part of the Banner Health and Banner Alzheimer's Institute community of patients, families, and supporters. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank our sponsors, Prisma and Nuance. As a bit of housekeeping, just to let you know, today's session is being recorded and we currently do have all of you muted. Now there will be a little time at the end of today's session for questions. So if you have any for our presenters today, please submit them at any time using the chat function and I will share as many as I can with our presenters. Now, a bit of history before we begin today's talk. In 2006, Banner Health established the Banner Alzheimer's Institute in Phoenix. It's now recognized as a leader in Alzheimer's disease research and setting a new standard of care for patients and their families. In 2020, as a result of significant philanthropic support, Banner opened Banner Alzheimer's Institute in Tucson including the Tool Family Memory Center, which provides diagnosis, support, and care for patients throughout Southern Arizona. Thanks to the generosity of the Edson family, in August 2021, the Institute was expanded to include the J. Oren Edson Family Louis Body Center. Louis Body may be a new term to those of you who are attending today. But actually, Lewy body disease is the second most common form of dementia, Alzheimer's being the most common and well-known. Lewy body disease is often misdiagnosed and frequently identified as Parkinson's disease. As a result, many patients receive inappropriate treatment and care, and distressing symptoms may go untreated. While many of you may not have heard of Lewy body dementia, there are many people you will recognize who were diagnosed with this disease, such as Robin Williams, Ted Turner, and Estelle Getty. Today, we are fortunate to have two experts lead us through a discussion of what Lewy body dementia is and challenges a family can face, Dr. Alan Anderson and Hella Brand. Additionally, we will hear and see the differentiators that make the J. Oren Edson Lewy Body Dementia Center a center of excellence in our community. So let's start our program today with a conversation. I want to introduce to you Hella Brand, who is a highly experienced physician assistant who has dedicated her career to caring and for patients and their families living with dementia. Hella has been with Banner Alzheimer's Institute for about 14 years. She helped establish Banner Alzheimer's Institute Phoenix location, and then moved to Tucson to launch the Institute with Dr. Anderson. Our conversation today is going to have Hella Brand, who's going to be joined by a family affected by Lewy body dementia, Donna and TK Warfield. Welcome, Hella, Donna, and TK. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. It's good to see everybody. And, um, and I want to acknowledge as well, uh, thanks for participating in this program today to all of the participants and especially TK and Donna to you. Um, TK, let's start with you. Uh, what we want to get is a sense of what you first noticed in terms of changes in yourself. Okay. My, it's, it's, it was rather acute. Um, I was really um, as a, I, I, I'm a sur veterinary surgeon mm -hmm. and I wor work long hours and that sort of stuff. And I've done that for many years. Been a veterinarian for 40, 41 years at the Valley Animal Hospital in Tucson. And um, enjoy what I do a lot. But one day I was seeing a client and I just kind of collapsed. And it came on very acute. Uh, I recovered pretty quickly as well, but I saw my, my 
primary care doctor and he said, you know, we probably got to do some testing on you. So they did. And the results of those tests was the same re response. He said, I don't think anything's wrong with you, but to be safe, we, let's get some testing done. So they had, uh, at that point, let me see, we had well, just a standard full body test to see if they could find anything. Okay. Um, then, when you say you just collapsed, was that fainting or what happened? I just fell to the ground. Just fell to the ground. Okay. And if I remember right, uh, TK, uh, in talking to you in the past, one of the other symptoms you noticed was, as you said, you've been a, a veterinarian for over 40 years. And one day, I think you didn't recognize or know what one of the surgical tools was. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So but I didn't, so, it, was, it was the end of the working day. So I just, didn't really think much about it. I was in a long, long surgery uh -huh. uh, on a dog's bush knee, and and that happens all the time. You get get just tired and yeah. So you wrote it off as fatigue at the moment. Exactly. Okay, Donna. Is there anything you want to add to that? Um, my observations at the time were, I I felt like. You know, when when we did get a diagnosis, I thought, where where have I been? Why did I not see some of this? And um, because he did work long days and long hours, um, and and his primary technician was was filling in the blank sometimes. I know he didn't sometimes even realize it. Mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't present. So I didn't see a lot of that. And, and again, you know, coming home at night and maybe not finding the right word at that moment didn't, didn't really didn't register with me. Right. right. Okay. Um, and that's quite common, right? That the signs are so subtle in the beginning for people that it is hard to recognize them or to, you attribute them to aging or fatigue or, or whatever. So you initially uh, sought help because you thought it was a medical problem, you had collapsed. What happened from there in terms of actually getting to a point of diagnosis? How many doctors did you have to see, for instance? At least two. Mm -hmm. At least two? Yeah, maybe more. Mm -hmm. uh, my primary care doctor, Gave me a gave me a history gave me a an exam. Mm -hmm. Said I don't think anything's wrong with you, but to be safe, let's do more testing. And that was the second doctor, um, a, a neurologist. And um, after a few questions and one of the many cognitive tests that they frequently give, um, he recommended a full scale uh, neuropsych exam. It's a long eight hour exam that takes all day. Um, we didn't jump into that right away from his conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. But in the fall of 2015, September, uh, he did sit for this eight hour exam. And it was incredibly awful. <laughs> the worst exam I've ever had. I mean, they did a good job, not to say that, but it was very hard on me. Yeah, I bet it was a bit anxiety provoking. Very much. Oh, it took me days to, re to recover. recover. To yeah. recover from that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, from the neuropsych exam, um, what happened in terms of a, a suggested diagnosis or recommendations? Well, they, they came out, they came out smiling and uh, she did rather and and then she turned her mouth and clearly that, 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 that there was something that was wrong with me that she, she made it very clear. And she said, I'm pretty sure that you have Alzheimer's disease. Okay. And then so, she talked to us what that meant. And we were both very, we knew already about those disease because we did 
because I'm been around been around in the room mm -hmm. and uh, pretty pretty hard to handle that. And I from that point um, we um, saw the um, one of the neurologists uh, very highly recommended and brilliant individual and uh, we started seeing him. I believe in January of 216 um, and on a regular basis. And, um, um, you know, each time we'd visit him, he would give the mini cog exam, uh, which was always, even the mini one was very stressful for him. Uh, but, um, and we saw him until um, he took one look at TK like almost three years later and he said oh my gosh when did this start and he observed the mask what they call the mask mm -hmm. and the arms forward mm -hmm. the shuffle gait um i had noticed the certainly the the facial change and the arms and i i i knew nothing about it i mean i was ignorant at that point i just mm -hmm. couldn't understand what was happening um, and I agree, I think that individual realized right away that he may have missed the diagnosis from the beginning. Okay. So um, for several years, you were proceeding with the assumption that you had Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. and then physical no, symptoms no. Yes. started manifesting more. Yeah, when no. we were seeing Dr. Ahern, for, we just assumed it was Alzheimer's. He kept calling it Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe he did. Yeah, until until he made that observation. Okay. And he told me, we'll get some more tests done. The test they did was when it was a... Uh, they did a, a CAT scan? CATS, yeah. And we were hoping that it had, would have a good result. But unfortunately, it came out. He's, he said that uh, this is consistent with for Alzheimer's. Mal and I said, How did you know that? And they showed me the uh, changes that happen in your in the brain. In the brain. Okay. And, okay. So now you've gone through two physicians because your primary care originally said no worries. Um, then you went to the neuropsychologist and the neurologist for a few years. How did your journey then bring you to Banner Alzheimer's Institute? And actually, we can add one more doctor. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I forgot about this. My primary care doctor said, I'm going to send you to a neurophysician in Tucson, which we did. And I, he did another minor uh, test. I did fine. And he said, "I don't think I don't think anything's wrong with you, but to be taste, but to be sure, we would, should do another test." And that was the one that that uh, we had to wait in the wait for about just about a half a half of a day, and and uh, they they said your your the response to that was uh, consistent with Alzheimer's disease. Okay. And I know that um, we have a, a very dear friend, um, TK had been her veterinarian for many, many, many years, uh, one of our uh, representatives in Congress. And um, she had just toured the Banner Alzheimer's Inter Institute in Phoenix. And she was able to have a conversation with Dr. Terrio and um, she called us, I think at 10 o'clock one night and she said, I, I got this set up for you. And sure enough, I mean, everyone have, was wonderful. They followed through with what they said. We had a conversation with Dr. Terrio and uh, we had the opportunity to meet him and, and, and felt that he, you know, he was gonna become our physician. Um, and of course, Hella has been, to all who are listening, she has been incredible. Um, and because Dr. Terrio is, is primarily in Phoenix, she 
was our contact person here in Tucson. And um, it, it's, we've been just impressed. So it's been great since we've come to Banner Alzheimer's Institute. The problem is I'm not cured. Right, right. So when you saw Dr. Terrio, then is when your diagnosis got changed to dementia with Lewy bodies. Okay. Correct. Correct. So mm -hmm. did that make sense to you then when you learned more about it compared to what you might have read about Alzheimer's disease? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I, I, a lot of things fell into place for me because immediately I tried to educate myself via the internet, books, whatever I could get my hands on. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's, it is just a quick side note. It's interesting, our daughter-in-law, at least a year before, she does a lot of reading too, just for her own uh, edification. And she told me, she said, you know, it doesn't sound like Alzheimer's to me. It sounds like Lewy body. And, you know, I mean, I, I said, well, thank you. But, you know, of course, <laughs> she's just reading. So I wasn't going to take her word for it. But it was interesting mm -hmm. that someone, a lay person and, and someone, yes, close to the family would make that mm -hmm. observation. Mm hmm. So how was it to react for both of you to a new diagnosis now in terms of coming to grips with that? It's been difficult. Been difficult. Very difficult. So how, so? how so? Um, well, every day is, is a different day for me right now. Um, can't do the things that I used to do. Um, I'm trying to find ways to work around it. I work very hard at trying to, to, to I try to uh, eat pre as best as we, we can. And Donna, my wife is very good about making sure I eat well. I, I exercise every day. Mm -hmm. I take the medications that have been been given to me, um, and uh, try to try to work through the, the things that I used to be able to do and that cannot do now any longer. Mm -hmm. Being able to to speak this way right now is the result of me working and Donna helping me mm -hmm. get to a point where I'm more functional than I was when this started. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the, um, the work of um, care partnering, right? You each have to learn to offer help, accept help, um, and uh, rely on each other for different reasons that way. Donna, how was it for you? Um, I mean, ever, ever since the, even the initial diagnosis, um, you know, at the beginning, we kind of carried on as normal, his activities, uh, as far as his personal uh, self continued for a while, but then, you know, and again, I just tried to educate myself as much as possible, but one of the things what, that was stressful for me is the difference in life expectancy mm -hmm. between Alzheimer's and Lewy body. And I know every individual is different and they don't always, you know, follow the rule, but um, that's been, that's been pretty hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about uh, your family? How have they done with uh, the diagnosis? The family has been unbelievable. Uh, and my, and our friends. Mm -hmm. I've, I was told that stay busy, mm -hmm. go go and visit your friends and that sort of stuff. We've done all of that and we've worked really hard on it. And I, I couldn't be more prop, more happy and mm -hmm. and feel so re, so blessed to be have a family and friends that would do this for me and my whole family. I know our, our two daughters, we have three children. Our two daughters have been, are very different in personality. Um, they've each kind of taken their own route to understanding and support. They've both been very supportive. I think the hardest 
it's been hardest on our son uh, because he and his dad are very, very close. Uh, they climbed high mountains in Alaska and Washington and Mexico City and um, very close relationship. And that has been really, really difficult for our son. Uh, my, TK taught him how to rebuild a car and you know, and now that's not possible. And so, I mean, it, it um, again, every, everyone is an individual and how they react to that is very individualistic. Um, but the children have all been incredibly supportive and loving and patient. Good, good. And that's really part of the success in uh, navigating the, the journey that is dementia is having that support network, right? People you can count on to step in and help, uh, to be there, to just visit with you um, and to keep you engaged in activities, have that continual sense of things to look forward to. And I'd like to also say that, you know, my, my family doesn't end at, the, at my home, Bambury. It's, mm -hmm. we, we are, I have a very large family. All I, the other people who add to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. I love them to death. Yeah. If you had to just beginning to notice symptoms or try to get to a point of diagnosis or are living with uh, someone uh, with a diagnosis, what would you advise? My, my advice would be, again, that, you know, that every family, every family situation is different, but I would say educate yourself as much as possible. Um, and of course, a lot of information there, it, it, you yeah. have to pick and choose what is most pertinent for your individual situation. Not everything is across the board. Um, I pray for patients every day, um, but reach out to as many resources as you possibly can. Books, gyms, um, uh, activities, you know, just, diet. just, you know, diet, just try to make yourself avail yourself of as, as many resources as possible. Okay. okay. What would you add to her comments? Act, stay active mm -hmm. and, uh, tell people about what's hap what's happening to you and and I've been amazed at how, how helpful they've been in understanding and what you're going through. Mm -hmm. So I don't have any problem. I'll go in and just tell them I have a neurologic problem and I'm working hard to get better. And, mm -hmm. and they, they, they help me do whatever I want to do. Mm -hmm. Someone takes me off to lunch every, every week. Mm -hmm. or more. And I think that is one of the um, successful ways to manage, you know, in terms of sharing the diagnosis is it allows others to step back and help you, right? Um, other, if they don't know what's going on, they don't know to offer help or how to help you. So when you can be a little more uh, proactive and let them know, hey, here's what I'm, I'm, um, experiencing and even doing your little part to educate them about what you're experiencing um, and then letting them be there for you. Part of that big network that, that we talk about. Right. You are blessed. I know, I know. I think our time is drawing close. Do you have any other last comments that you wanna make in general? Um, as, as a caregiver, um, I know that it's uh, very important for me to understand that my days have to be more, much more planned and structured than they used to be. Mm -hmm. um, if he's having a bad day, that plan can go right out the window and we're back to square one and I have to rethink the whole day. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just making sure that I have patience <laughs> which sometimes I don't, um, but just knowing that you can't take the day for granted because like TK said earlier, every day is new 
Mm -hmm. um, in some ways. And um, as things move along, you learn new things every day and how to cope with their new things. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just, um, just rethinking the structure of your life really mm -hmm. from what it had been. Yeah. And that is one, one of the great challenges for uh, caregivers in, in particular is, is um, one constantly having to learn a new way, just as, as you are uh, TK, but uh, learning new strategies, um, developing those coping mechanisms, uh, acknowledging that you're human and, and you're gonna have good days and bad days too. Uh, developing that predictability, that constancy and routine that benefits TK, um, but being realistic enough to know that flexibility and resilience is ultimately what you need. Right. right. Keeping, keeping an open mind is mm -hmm. pretty important for me, mm -hmm. and I don't always achieve that. <laughs> I think you do a great job. TK, any so, closing so comments? No, I just hope that the work that you are, you and your your folks can help the many other people that are going through what I what I am, and that we can put a closure for them and others in the future. Great. Thank you both so much for uh, sharing your insights, sharing your experiencing. Um, we really appreciate it. And I'm sure people have a better sense of, of kind of what you're going through and, or what they might be going through. We hope so. We, we are happy to share that, that, those stories, so. Great, thank you. We'll thank turn you. it back to Heather. Thank you to you, Kella, um, for your expert facilitation skills. And Donna and TK, I just want to thank you for your candidness. I know you keep saying how um, each situation is unique, but there are definite commonalities that can be drawn out of your story. And it's um, such a powerful story. And I'm sure that our attendees have learned so much for you, from you. So thank you for your, your bravery and your candidness. You're welcome. Thank you. We, we're very proud of you. Very happy with the work that you guys are doing, and, and I'm just uh, hoping it continues. Okay. Thank you. High five, TK. <laughs> well, I see a lot of um, questions that are coming in through the chat right now, really um, kind of looking, asking more about Lewy body dementia and kind of the pathology behind it and um, initial symptoms. So I want to kind of transition our conversation and we'll bring Hella back a little bit later. Um, but I want to invite Dr. Anderson to join us and talk a little bit more about the specifics of Lewy body. Now, Dr. Alan Anderson is a board certified geriatric psychi psychiatrist performing evaluation and treatment of patients and their family caregivers. He has served as a principal investigator in clinical trials of treatments for dementia. He has an appointment of clinical assistant professor in neurology and psychiatry at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Dr. Anderson is the current director of the Tool Family Memory Center and J. Oren Edson Lewy Body Dementia Center at the Banner Alzheimer's Institute in Tucson. At this center, he leads a dedicated staff of dementia care specialists providing clinical care to patients and families, as well as leading clinical trials and other research in dementia. Welcome, Dr. Anderson. Well, thank you very much, Heather, and, and thanks for the uh, great session. Uh, with Hella and Don and TK and giving some personal uh, stories about the way this disease can affect folks. So I'm just going to give a few brief uh, slides and hopefully we'll also have some time for some questions. First of all, I want to start with our mission. So our mission both here at, at Banner Alzheimer's Institute in Tucson and our sister organizations in Phoenix have a three-part mission statement. Certainly we would like to end Alzheimer's disease and other dementias such as Lewy body dementia without losing another generation. Uh, the second bullet set a new national standard of patient and family care. This is a, a very big emphasis on all of our programs. We wanna provide a very comprehensive care approach, not only helping the patients, uh, but also helping families navigate through
through this disease, whether it be Alzheimer's, Lewy body, or some other form of dementia. And then lastly, for new models of collaboration in biomedical research. Uh, we are engaged in new trials here at the BAI, and we will be engaging in some Lewy body studies as that program gets up and running. Next slide, please. So what is this Lewy body dementia and, and what does it mean and, and how do we use these terms? So the first thing that's important to tell folks is that Lewy body dementia is actually what we would term an umbrella term. It is not a specific term because it includes two different disease states, dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease dementia. Now, both of these are combined to believe now to occupy about 20% of all dementia cases. So they're thought to be second now to Alzheimer's disease in terms of frequency. And just quickly, one of the differences is uh, while they both have the same underlying pathology of what's going on in the brain, the dementia with Lewy bodies does not start with movement problems. It starts more with dementia symptoms and therefore has often been confused over years as if it's something different like Alzheimer's disease. And the movement problems of Parkinsonism start later in the course. In Parkinson's disease dementia, it's the opposite. The movement problems start earlier, followed by the dementia later on. And, and of course, in dementia with Lewy bodies, 100% are going to have dementia. It's estimated that most Parkinson's patients as they age will indeed get dementia if they live long enough and death doesn't come from some other cause. Next slide, please. So what is Lewy body dementia? And what are some underlying causes? There was a, a chat question about heritability, uh, inheritance of, of this disease. There are small, a small percentage of patients that have a genetic influence that causes a disease, but most of the patients with either dementia of Lewy body or Parkinson's disease dementia are not inherited, they're sporadic cases. And another question looked at, well, what are some of the symptoms? Well, we define Lewy body dementia and dementia with Parkinson's disease, first of all, by being a syndrome of dementia. And just to clarify that term, a simple way of thinking about dementia is dementia is the loss of cognitive abilities as adults age. And there are some dementias that can occur very early, like dementias due to head trauma. Uh, football players, boxers, people who are in bad accidents or repeated head trauma. But most of our dementia start later in life, and that's certainly the case with Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease dementia. And the other issue in terms of the other core feature of a dementia is that it has to interfere with day-to-day -day activities. I mean, you heard DK talking about how early on he had some very much problem of recognizing how to use a, a surgical instrument that he probably used hundreds of times. So that's the syndrome of dementia. And then how is going to bring up a few other associated symptoms, but the major or what we call core symptoms of Lewy body are the four bullet points underneath syndrome of dementia. And that includes fluctuating symptoms. And in some of the cases, I have cases where that is so significant that people can seem very alert and then 30 minutes later, be in a stupor. And that can occur throughout the day, these changes. They often have well-formed visual hallucinations. Now, while this can occur in diseases like Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia, they tend to occur earlier in Lewy body dementia. And they're often people, they may see people sitting around their dining room table. And sometimes they may say, to their spouse, why aren't you serving dinner to these people? They look hungry. They can, in many cases, be non-threatening, but in some cases, they can be threatening. So these are, are something that really can uh, help us make the differential when we're seeing patients with that symptom. They have a lot of sleep problems, but one of the more prominent problems with sleep is something called REM, behavioral sleep disorder, REM standing for rapid eye movement. And typically when we dream, we're in REM, that's the dream state. And all of our muscles other than our eye muscles are paralyzed. But in the unusual case of REM behavioral sleep disorder, that paralysis does not exist. And so people could be struggling in their dream and suddenly be hitting, pushing, kicking, 
or in other words, potentially harming their bed part. And so spouses sometimes get hit. I had one case where a man was strangling his wife in the middle of the night. So this can be a very dangerous symptom that needs treatment. And then finally, they have the onset of Parkinsonian movement disturbance. And that's things like the shuffling gait, uh, tremor, which is less likely in dementia with Lewy bodies, slowness, flatness of facial expression, drooling, and some other issues. And again, uh, Helen a little later will tell you some of the other kind of medical and other symptoms that occur, but these are the core features of Lewy body dementia. Next slide. Well, how do we detect Lewy body? It, truly the best way is to take a good history, look for some of those core features, document those, but we do have a couple of things that could be supportive of the diagnosis. Now, none of these are essentially gold standard tests that say the patient has this, but they are supportive. And top on the list is something called a DAT scan. And that's a scan that looks at the dopamine receptors in the parts of the brain that are hit by this disease. And there are certain patterns that are normal patterns and certain patterns that support Parkinson's or, or dementia with Lewy bodies. We could do a sleep study. The sleep study may then show the rapid eye movement behavioral disorder, the brain behavioral sleep disorder. There's a very helpful test, but it's just kind of too uh, expensive and not necessary for the myocardial scintography test. And we don't really do that test. And I'll just mention quickly that we don't have an accurate blood test for this disease. And even though there's been a fair amount of research on doing a skin biopsy that looks at some of the same cellular pathology that occurs in the brain occurring in skin, it really has not been something that's been researched to the point of being useful at this time. Next slide, please. When we talk about treatment, uh, one thing that comes to mind in Parkinson's patients initially is often to treat the movement disturbance. And there are a number of treatments available for that, FDA approved for that. They can also be used in dementia with Lewy body patients when they start to have some of the movement disorders. The next two medications are actually approved specifically for Parkinson's disease. Uh, the rivastigmine is approved for Parkinson's disease dementia. Pimavanserin is actually a newer agent that's approved to treat the visual and other hallucinations of Parkinson's disease, which can occur in Parkinson's disease, in Lewy body dementia, or Parkinson's disease dementia. The bottom four are medications that can sometimes be helpful. We often see a number of behavioral issues that occur in these patients, from depression to apathy, to agitated behaviors, to psychotic symptoms. We mentioned the hallucinations, they can also have delusions, which are fixed false beliefs. And so we can sometimes be helping patients by putting them on medications like SSRIs, which are you know, some of the newer serotonin, amp serotonin antidepressants. Melatonin can be a great help for the REM behavioral sleep disorder and other sleep disturbances. Antipsychotics, we usually try to avoid because one of the supporting symptoms of these patients are very sensitive to the side effects of medications in the antipsychotic category. But sometimes they're necessary to use and we try to choose one that will have fewer effects on the movement disorder. And then lastly, there are occasions where we might use psychostimulants because apathy syndromes are also very prevalent. So these behavioral manifestations can be more prevalent in patients with Lewy body dementias compared to other dementia syndromes. And that's in fact why myself as a geriatric psychiatrist may be a great help to neurologists and other doctors that manage these patients. Care management is really where many of us feel is a vital service to patients and their families. And that's where people that like the excellent clinician that Hella is coming in to really work with the the spouse, the, the children, the family, as well as the patient to get a sense of how to walk them through and navigate them through the disease. Uh, one of the questions in the chat, does this degree disease progress or what's the prognosis? It is a neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's, it will progress. We hope to sometimes find some type of treatment for Alzheimer's in Lewy body that may slow things down, what we call disease modifying, but to date, we don't have any of those. We certainly don't have a cure. 
the things like environment and caregiver education and support and the use of exercise and other lifestyle issues, physical therapy, all of those can be very important. And you heard some of that from, from our uh, patient and caregiver earlier. Next slide, please. When we were putting together Louis Body Center, it was fun to find some quotations. And this is one that is right at our entrance that I like a lot from Robin Williams. You'll have bad times, but it'll always wake you up for the good stuff you weren't paying attention to. And so our goal here at BAI is to really find those things that are the good things in life. We wanna make people's lives be joyful. We wanna make spouses have an easier time so that we can keep the patient and the spouse together and avoid institutionalization. So I will end my discussion there and turn it back to the moderator. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. I think your talk really addressed a lot of the questions that our participants were having. And this is such um, interesting information and so much information. I, I'm glad to remember that we are recording this session right now so we can reference it again um, afterwards. So after Dr. Anderson's talk, I think you can tell um, caring for a person with dementia is not just about addressing medical needs. For many, the non-medical aspects of care are the most exhausting and difficult. So I want to invite Hella Brand to join us again and talk to a, talk to a little bit more about those non-medical aspects of care. Thank you, Heather. So we're going to talk about the challenges of Lewy body dementia, kind of what sets it aside from other dementias in a lot of respects, even though, as um, Heather said earlier, there are commonalities. The pathway ultimately is a commonality amongst all dementias, but the initial presentations um, and, and how it progresses over time can vary between all of the dementias. Next slide. So um, some of this will be review or just reiterating what you heard from um, Dr. Anderson. Uh, but one of the challenges with Lewy body is that there can be kind of physical health or general health symptoms um, early on. And one of the questions I saw uh, in the chat room was, why did TK fall to the ground? Well, these are people who can have fainting or near fainting episodes, what we call syncopal or near syncopal episodes. And it's because they can have more instability of the blood pressure and their heart rate. Um, so that may very uh, well be what happened in that moment. Um, and really the challenge is that that part of the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system that controls our bodily functions isn't as effective. So other symptoms they can have, you already heard about the intolerance to medications. They can be very sensitive to uh, medications. Uh, the REM sleep disorder you heard about, but uh, difficulty controlling their body temperature, offer, often complaining that they're very cold on a hot day, for instance, or sweating profusely, changing from moment to moment. Uh, constipation, erectile dysfunction can be challenges um, as well. Okay, next slide. And a big part of managing uh, Lewy body, as it can be with any of the dementias, is managing the um, emotional and behavior uh, symptoms that we can see. So the challenges can be uh, early onset of depression, of anxiety, as they learn to adjust to uh, changing functional abilities. And I think one of the big challenges is if we compare those who have Lewy body dementia to those who have Alzheimer's disease, is the, the cognition, even though they're experiencing changes in memory and thinking, tends to stay more intact for a longer period of time than does the comparable person with Alzheimer's disease. So I'm not surprised to see someone with Lewy body uh, come in, in in moderate stage and say, hi, Hella. Um, and the, the person with Alzheimer's might say, oh, I've seen you before, but not recall my name, for instance. Um, so with that, that cognition kind of intact, it, it makes them more sensitive to the changes. Um, and we're going to talk about the physical changes that really uh, represent the challenge for them. Um, anxiety can come from trying, trying to do those things. As you heard TK say, I, 
I, I know about veterinary medicine. I've done this for over 40 years, but all of a sudden not recognizing a, a tool um, or somebody else I worked with uh, who worked in a nursery and couldn't think of the names of plants anymore uh, in the moment. So that can uh, make it difficult, a lowered frustration uh, tolerance. So things that used to be done so easily, efficiently um, and without second thought, become a great challenge. So that can cause these mood changes. Dr. Anderson already alluded to some of the uh, behavioral changes with the hallucinations. And I think one of the uh, distinctions again is if we look at Alzheimer's disease, we don't always see true hallucinations as we do in dementia with Lewy bodies. Oftentimes what we see is more illusions or misperceptions. So they see uh, a reflective surface and view it as people in the house, for instance, see a picture of themselves um, in the mirror, um, misinterpret uh, pictures in the living room as people. Um, so I think it's a difference in, and misperception can be seeing a crack in the sidewalk and thinking it's a snake. So it's not that they're truly hallucinating uh, uh, seeing a snake, they're misperceiving something in their environment. Next slide. So when we look at the physical symptoms, this is really what um, affects people with Lewy body or dementia with Lewy body uh, uh, syndrome much earlier than somebody in Alzheimer's disease where we may see some Parkinson's-like features in uh, the later moderate stage, for instance. But the challenge is when you've got shaking in your hands or tremors, um, and you can have them in your face, your legs, uh, your trunk, and your muscles are progressively getting stiffer or more rigid, your movements are much, much slower, your posture more stooped, um, your balance and coordination are nowhere as close to where they can be, which puts you at risk for falls. Um, and then you heard about uh, drooling. And I think a big challenge, again, that can contribute to that depression um, is the difficulty communicating. So if you listen to TK, you might have heard that his voice was a little bit softer and he had to work, as he said, I'm working today. Uh, so we heard a, a, a more normal voice, but their voice becomes very soft, very raspy. And as their head comes forward, they, uh, you really can't hear what they're saying all the time and they can sound more mumbling. So just communicating in a way that you normally would can become a challenge. And then the other is we can see that masked face that you heard them talk about, that sense of uh, not registering any expression in their face. Um, and if you saw in the earlier slide and the emotion uh, side, that sometimes is interpreted as depression and it isn't always depression. Um, and they can have decreased eye blink. So what do we do for these people in terms of our services and in general? Next slide. So an important part of it in all of our visits and particularly through our family and community services program is to provide that necessary education and counseling. Um, and it is, uh, it is a, a system that gets affected. So there's the person with the dementia, there's the can't, the caregiver, there's the family, um, and they all need some level of education and support and learning how to cope, um, learning how to manage a day um, effectively from day to day. So Donna talked about, uh, you know, creating the structure, but leaving flexibility so that the day doesn't become more stressful than it needs to. Um, so the way we provide support for our caregivers, um, all virtually right now, and I think it's a credit to our team that there was not a dropped moment in uh, COVID. We went from doing live in present in person presentations to doing virtual support groups, virtual life enrichment classes and caregiver education classes. So these are all open to people. Uh, we have a wealth of um, written material that we can uh, point to people and then also just community resources. Um, a big part of it obviously is managing symptoms. So managing the mood, uh, managing behaviors, uh, managing the dementia itself and medications, um, helping understand how to use non 
medication strategies to address mood behavior, um, how to promote communication. And then I think the really exciting part in terms of if you picture yourself in that um, uh, physical uh, situation that we talked about with the J. Edson Center. Now we're going to have the opportunity to offer these people the necessary physical therapy, speech therapy to maximize their function through big and loud programs. So they learn to move in large movements rather than the close and stiff movements. Uh, they get to project their voice more. Um, that's that's the loud component. Um, and to participate in regular exercise programs, innovative exercise programs, uh, power gym. And I saw a reference earlier to um, alternative therapies, and we're going to see some of those as well. And, um, you know, if you've bred up on Parkinson's disease, for instance, uh, dancing and tango in particular is very effective for people. And I um, saw a fabulous presentation one day on the use of miming uh, with uh, Parkinson's. So I think stay tuned. Uh, but I think overall, the, the key point here is that um, we're going to provide that support that families need, that the person needs. Uh, we're gonna provide education at the community level. So there's a greater understanding. Um, and, and then in terms of bringing them um, into our programs, we're going to provide opportunities for social socialization, a sense of community, a sense of being with others who are experiencing what they're experiencing and ultimately create motivation and inspiration. So as you saw with uh, Dr. Anderson, that quote is right as you come in the main hall with butterflies all over it. Um, um, and I'll leave you with a few other quotes. Um, so we did look for inspiration ourselves and these are very prominently displayed in the exercise area. So challenges don't define us, our actions do. Uh, from Muhammad Ali, don't count the days, make the days count. And then Michael Fox, again, my view of life is colored by humor and looking at the best in any situation. Heather. Thank you again so much, Hella, for such an informative presentation. Um, we've had so many questions coming out and we only have a few minutes left with each other. So I'm hoping that we could get through a couple of these and then we'll plan to follow up with our participants with maybe a fact sheet that we could address um, more of these at a different time. And Heather, um, I did try answering some of these myself uh, on the chat. Perfect. Fantastic. Um, well, one of the questions that came in um, was related to high blood pressure. And I wonder if you could speak to um, other risk factors for developing Lewy body dementia, because uh, Dr. Anderson, I know you mentioned there's not typically um, a genetic connection. Yeah, there, there's the, the genetic factors are, are a rare uh, form of, of Parkinson's disease, dementia, or Lewy body dementia. Um, you know, there, we haven't really studied risk factors in this disorder as we have in Alzheimer's disease, okay? And, and it just makes sense that some of the risk factors would probably be the same, although they haven't been studied well, like, you know, things like smoking, um, not having a regular exercise routine or being sedentary, having problems with high blood pressure that goes untreated or diabetes that go untreated. Uh, these are things that aren't good for the heart, they're not good for the brain. Um, there is one risk factor, however, that uh, we may see at some point in time, and that is there is some connection with viral infections. Uh, the influenza outbreak in 1918 was related to a number of uh, cases. And this gets to a very complicated issue of what's called epigenetics, how, how genes are released and, and things are controlled through unraveling of the genetic code. It's a rather complicated scenario. But we think that there are some things that may go on environmentally. You, you probably know that there's been some connected to, connection to pesticide use and, and Parkinson's. But, but the majority of Parkinson's is a Parkinson's problem that comes on sporadically without any true identifiable this risk or this genetic. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. And, and since you bring up our current situation with the COVID-19 pandemic, I wonder if either or both of you could speak to how has the pandemic impacted um, people living with dementia and even more specifically people with Lewy body? Yeah, I'll let Hella handle that. 
Yeah. So, you know, certainly one of the concerns was um, an increase in uh, depression and increase in anxiety. Um, you know, anytime there's a stressful situation, it will make um, even dementia worse in general in terms of clarity of thinking. But um, part of it was people were glued to the radio, glued to the television for, you know, the news. What's the news? What's the news? And in dementia in particular, we least want to feed negative information into a brain. We really strive to keep things pleasant and light. I think a challenge with the dementia with Lewy bodies, um, well, let me say one other thing. Um, Pre-COVID, if people had good routines established, getting out and going out to eat with friends, uh, going for walks, they lost that routine when they um, settled in for quarantining, right? And losing a routine is hard to get back. And with the dementia with Lewy bodies in particular, maintaining physical activity, really stretching those extremities out, um, we lost a lot of that. And I think that makes uh, people weaker. Um, and the challenge was to try and work with them on how do you create movement within the house? How do you still replace those activities that you had with something that you could do in the house. Interesting. Thank you. And then um, maybe one more question. We just, again, have a couple more minutes left. Um, but I'm wondering, is there a difference, since most of us are more familiar with Alzheimer's disease, is there a difference in how you would approach someone with Lewy body dementia for those of us who maybe have a family member or friend with this disease, or do we do similar strategies for what we would with Alzheimer's? Uh, okay, I didn't know if you were ready to speak there, Dr. Anderson. I, um, I think I a think lot of the education you. and approach is still going to be very similar to how we approach Alzheimer's, and that is to um, modify our communication, uh, modify activities and tasks so that people can continue to be successful, um, give them support where things are needed. Um, but then also, I think, you know, with that cognitive awareness remaining uh, longer in the uh, Lewy body, I think it is more about that individual support, emotional support, to just talk about what that feels like and to acknowledge the validity of what they're experiencing um, and to create that sense of hope for them. Great, thank you so much to both of you. And thank you to all of our participants as well. Again, these questions just keep rolling in. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you everybody for your interest in this important subject. And again, afterwards, we will be sure to compile some answers and send them um, out in subsequent emails. So I do want to thank Hella, Dr. Anderson, um, TK and Donna um, for your presentation this evening. I think it was very insightful and it educated a lot of us on um, something that is more prevalent, I think, than a lot of us really expected. You know, TK earlier on when um, he was speaking said that the problem is that I'm not cured. And BAI's real commitment to the community is that we need research to treat, prevent, and cure dementia for future generations. But in the meantime, after today, I'm sure you can see living with dementia and specifically Lewy body dementia requires both medical and non-medical care, education and support. And we are privileged to have Banner Alzheimer's Institute Tucson and the Edson Family Lewy Body Dementia Center and the family of expert providers that are available for our community. I want to express our sincere appreciation to the tool and the Edson families who made Banner Alzheimer's Institute Tucson possible through their philanthropic investment. Thank you to all of our virtual guests this evening, and thank you again to our sponsors, Prisma and Nuance. Take care, everybody. Goodbye.